Hello, and welcome to our beginner series for V-Ray for Maya. In this video, we'll explore the rendering process and how to control the quality of your renders for a given amount of time. Take a moment to download our project files linked in the video description so you can explore the scene in your own time. Let's get started. We're working with a simple scene. Let's assume it's prepped for a final render. In our previous Getting Started videos, we used Interactive Production Rendering, or IPR for short, while still developing the scene. But now, we are ready to take a look at production rendering and some of its most important settings. For look development, I've been using a smaller resolution, as you can see here on top of the frame buffer. This way, the scene's interactivity was faster. The first thing we need to do for our final render here is to set the resolution to a higher one. This can be done in the Render Settings window under the Common tab. I'll increase it to full HD resolution. Next, we'll navigate to the V-Ray tab to adjust the image sampler settings. There are two image sampler types available, Progressive and Bucket, each with its own advantages. For example, the Progressive Sampler refines the entire image over time, allowing for a quicker full image view and the option to set a rendering time limit. Conversely, the Bucket Sampler excels in memory utilization and is more efficient for distributed rendering. By default, the sampler type is set to progressive. We can control our render's quality by adjusting the maximum render time or the noise threshold. If we're up against a tight deadline, say an hour, we can set the time limit to one hour, and when it reaches this amount of time, the rendering will stop. If the render time is set to zero, V-Ray will render until it meets the set noise threshold or max subdivisions, whichever is reached first. I'll adjust the noise threshold to 0.005, which in most cases will produce a nice clean image. For images with very strong depth of field effects or motion blur, more samples will be needed for a noise-free result. In such cases, we need to increase the maximum subdivisions of the image sampler. It's also beneficial to increase the min subdivisions for elements like very thin hair, very small particles, or fast-moving objects with motion blur. Keep in mind that increasing the subdivisions will extend the render time as it instructs V-Ray to take more samples. We can find a good balance where we can have reasonable render time combined with the V-Ray denoiser to help clean the noise in the image. We'll touch on that shortly. Our next stop is the GI tab, which controls the calculation of global or indirect illumination. The brute force engine is the most accurate, but also the most time consuming. The default setting of light cache is pretty good for all scenes and lighting scenarios, and it's especially useful for interior shots. For scenes with less light available, such as interiors, we can increase the light cache subdivs for a better result. For post-render editing, we can navigate to the Render Element tab and select additional render outputs from the available list. This allows for editing specific render passes. In this instance, I'll incorporate the Back to Beauty preset, which contains all of the main render elements that make up this image. We can also add a masking render element in case we need to select only the ground or a specific object in the image. I'll add the Crypto Matte render element, which creates masks for every scene object. Before initiating the render, we must decide on the save location and file format. Under the Common tab within the Image Output rollout, we can set a path where our render image would be saved. We can do that in the file name prefix field. If we leave it as not set, in other words, leave it empty, the rendered image would be saved in the project folder that you've set. From the Image Format dropdown, we can select our preferred file format. Commonly, JPEG and PNG are used for 8-bit output, while EXR contains much more information and dynamic range that can be used in post-production. Note that we'll need to render out an EXR file to use the cryptomat masks we added a moment ago. Let's hit Render and wait for the result. I'll skip the rendering part and jump to right after it finishes. The image quality looks pretty decent and is automatically saved to the output path we specified. Another way to manually save the image directly from the frame buffer is to use the floppy disk icon. If we click and hold on the icon, we get different saving modes where we get to choose if we want to save just the final render or save it together with all the render elements that we chose earlier in a single EXR file. I'll also save the image in the history. As you can see, the render took approximately 13 minutes and 30 seconds. 
We can try to reduce the render time by lowering the image quality and adding a V-Ray denoiser to clear up some of the noise. I'll go ahead and increase the noise threshold amount a little bit. Then we can also add the V-Ray denoiser render element to the render elements list. Let's render the image again. The quality of the image looks decent enough. This render clocked in at 10 minutes and 38 seconds, roughly 20% quicker than our initial attempt. Another rendering mode to consider is the bucket mode. I'll switch the sampler type to bucket and increase the render quality by lowering the noise threshold. I'll also increase the min and max subdivisions to improve the depth of field in our final image. Now we can start rendering. You'll notice the colorful squares called buckets resolving small portions of the image. The more buckets present, the quicker the image renders. If we have extra computers or a dedicated render farm, we can include them in the rendering process by using something called distributed rendering. If we go over to the settings tab in the render settings under the distributed rendering rollout, we can tick the use distributed rendering checkbox by clicking on the DR settings button. We can add or remove additional machines to be involved in the rendering process. We can easily spot the additional buckets because they will appear labeled with the computer name they represent. As you can see, including several more machines into the rendering process lowers the time taken to complete the image. Distributed rendering is definitely a nice advantage, but what if you're limited to a single machine? You can use our dedicated Chaos Cloud service, which has hundreds of machines to speed up the rendering. I'll deactivate distributed rendering. To use the Chaos Cloud, simply click on its icon in the V-Ray shelf. The Chaos Cloud window will prompt you to export and submit, sending the V-Ray scene to the cloud for rendering. This will send you to the Chaos Cloud Submit job page in your browser, where you can create a project, name your scene, select a resolution, and more. Once we submit the job for rendering, we can click on the View Job button to see the progress. The right panel displays render job details, such as settings, resolution, render time, and credits used, while in the middle of the page, we get a preview of the rendering image. Once completed, we can download a zip file, which contains a JPEG version of the image and its render elements for preview purposes, and a multi-channel XR file containing the raw data for post-production. By now, you should know how to control the quality of your renders in the best possible way. Make sure you take a look at the rest of the videos from our Getting Started series. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. See you soon!